Welcome, 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 welcome. We have a very special guest today. We are talking to a premier uh, economic thinker, uh, Professor Christopher J. Coyne. Uh, let me cover the background now. He's here with us. We're going to continue our ongoing interview series on political division in America, uh, talking to writers, lawyers, thinkers, experts on how they view it so that you, the public, can make up your own informed opinion. Let's get right to it. Uh, here we go. Oh, whoops. I'll make sure we're doing that. Okay, yeah, everything's working. Christopher Coyne, professor of economics at George Mason University and also author of In Search of Monsters to Destroy, The Folly of American Empire and the Paths to Peace. He also speaks at the Independent Institute. He is the professor of economics at George Mason University and associate director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center. He's also co-editor of the Review of Austrian Economics and the Independent Review. He also serves as a book review editor for Public Choice and in 2010 Coin was a visiting scholar at the Social Philosophy and Policy Center at Bowling Green State University. In 2016, he was selected as a recipient of George Mason University's Teaching Excellence Award. Uh, he is an expert on economics. And today, I wanted to ask him these questions. But before we get to that, let's stop here. Uh, Professor, did I get anything wrong? Is there some background that you'd like to cover? Were there other accolades that you achieved that you want to make sure the public knows about? No, what you covered is perfect, and I appreciate it. Okay, perfect. That's all we're trying to do is make sure to get the information correctly to you, to the public. You can make up your own informed decision. And, and again, the reason that we're doing this is that we felt that the conversation around political divorce was very sophomoric, just a lot of name calling and not much specific. So these were the questions I, I talked to the professor about asking him today. I want to interview you about the theoretical economics of a potential red state nation that split off from America. You have a background in economics. This is a theoretical discussion. Critics say red states could not leave America because they are recipient states, meaning they receive more money from the federal government than they pay in annual federal income taxes. So the conclusion is that if red states left America or split from blue states, they would be automatically poor. But today, I wanted to ask the professor a couple of questions. Can you make economic adjustments to improve the quality of your economy. We're going to look at Puerto Rico, Ireland, and a concept called the optimum currency area. And basically, this is what we're looking at. So this is a corporate tax rates in Europe. And you can see that Ireland has one of the lowest ones in all of Europe, about 12.5%. Uh, that's being adjusted right now, and they have to raise it. But the point is, is that Ireland has been an international center for investment because of their exceptionally low corporate tax rate. I remember Jerry Brown, governor of California, going to Ireland and saying, look at all these California Silicon Valley companies headquartered in Ireland. And Ireland gets all their tax money. Wouldn't that be great if these California companies had tax money in California? Well, the reason for that is that U.S. corporate tax rates are out of line with most of the rest of the world. They're pretty high. That's why there's a lot of investment to Ireland. But that's not it. In Puerto Rico, you can pay no federal income taxes. And that has resulted in many people moving to there. In fact, the Puerto Rico economy is classified as a high income economy by the World Bank and as the most competitive economy in Latin America by the World Economic Forum. So let's start there. Professor, can you, do you agree with the premise that uh, if red states leave, they become automatically poorer because they are recipients of federal income, and so they would lose that money. Let's let's start with that. Is that a true statement in, in your opinion? I, I don't think it's necessarily true. I, I, I do think there is a cost to disentangling from the federal government uh, and from disassociating with that. The magnitude of that cost will will vary from situation to situation. And what will, what, what will influence it is both external and internal factors. And so on the external side, 
Uh, it depends what states uh, or what governments, state governments, what they're currently receiving from the federal government. And, th and that varies, of course. So there's that cost. Um, and the, the internal cost would be exactly what you said, which is you'd have to make adjustments to internal policies. And you highlighted tax policies, which are, are one powerful tool for either attracting or uh, 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 making it less attractive for business, depending which direction you go. But there's also a host of other tools that can be used. Uh, uh, regulations in general. Uh, uh, regulations are, from the, a business perspective, they are costs. A regulation imposes a burden on the party being regulated because they have to either refrain from certain actions they would have un otherwise taken, or they have to incur costs in order to meet the regulatory burden. And so you can envision a mix of reductions in regulatory burdens and changes in tax structures that would certainly make investment, uh, job creation uh, uh, more attractive. Uh, and, and at the core of this, I think it's important to remember, stepping back for a moment, where wealth comes from. Uh, and wealth comes from human creativity, from entrepreneurship, and from innovation. Uh, that's where wealth comes from. It doesn't come from on high. Uh, it, there, there's no other real magic sauce to it. Uh, uh, and, and so then it's, it's a function of what environments are people more able and willing to flex their creative muscles, their innovative muscles, and to bring to life their vision for a better world, which of course is not guaranteed. In a, in a market economy, success is not guaranteed. You have to t you have a conjecture. I think if I do X, I think consumers will like it. But then you have to test that conjecture against the actual world. But you need to bring it to life in the first place. And when there is excessive regulatory burden, when there is excessive taxation, uh, it certainly discourages at least some people from doing that. Let me bring something up, I think, to back up that point. Um, one of the things, yeah, one of the things we looked at was Brazil. Uh, Brazil, around 2010, had Lula Silva take over, and he dramatically changed the way that Brazil's economy had worked for maybe 30 years before, and they had massive, massive growth as a result result he's been covered in multiple newspapers uh, also china china had a particular way of looking at economics and then they changed when they joined the wto and they had incredible uh growth are these examples of what you're talking about where you can have changes in the regulatory environment changes in the way that your government interacts with business and you can receive and if you do radical change it, not guaranteed like you said not guaranteed you could fail some countries tried to do radical change and failed, but some like Brazil and China did radical changes, uh, changing 30 years of economic policy and saw ridiculous amounts of growth before that. Is, are those examples of what you're talking about, Professor? Certainly, certainly. And so, you know, one of the real fascinating things, I, I think it's quite exciting um, uh, for, for those of us who care about human well-being and flourishing around the world, is that economic development, it's tricky from the standpoint, as, as I mentioned, there's no secret recipe that, that you just can create it because it's not something you create, but it is something that you can encourage and you can actually turn things around relatively quickly. Uh, uh, again, actually doing that sometimes can be challenging because of political factors, ideological factors, and so on, meaning implementing these policy changes that we're talking about. But it's certainly within the realm of possibility. Now, there's other factors, and we should be clear about that. You know, it, it, the headline you have up about Brazil talks about oil. And so natural resources matter, of course, and mm -hmm. geographic location matters. So there are other factors, of course, but in, in terms of things within our control, meaning human control, policies are things that we can control because they're legislated. They are, they are objects of human choice. And so we can choose to either tax people more or tax them less. We can choose to impose more burdens on entrepreneurs or less. And so from my perspective, in terms of the things we can control and what we know about what it takes to develop... Uh, uh, from that standpoint, it's pretty straightforward, broadly, what needs to be done. So let me let me just do it. There was a lot there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a quick roundup. You can dramatically change your economy relatively quickly, sometimes, with a radical change in policies. Brazil and China are examples of that. 
regulatory burden is theoretically as bad as taxes on keeping business down and, and suppressing economic growth. And if I, I guess it goes without saying that if these red states had left, theoretically, they would be wanting to leave a lot of the bureaucracy, the federal government behind. And so they might be open to less regulations and being able to pass laws that fit their economy better. Things that they might not be able to do as long as they're part of America, right? Like they, you're part of the US. Hey, we want to have low taxes and low regulations here in Louisiana. Tough. There's tons of federal laws and we're never getting rid of them. Well, if I'm independent, that's not an issue. Is that is that a roughly fair way of thinking about this? Certainly. So that that that's definitely the right way of thinking about it. And then you have to weigh that, of course, against the the costs, which would also be context specific. And here's what I mean by that. There, there's the cost of implementing policy, just the political cost of getting it done. But then when you exit from an arrangement, there's adjustment costs. And so what would it look like in terms of migration? Would you have freedom of movement in and out? Because one of the really important checks, I think, in a free society is the ability to vote what's called voting with your feet, feet. which is, you know, if, if I, I'm in Virginia right now, if, I'm, if, if, if I want to start a business here and let's, let's assume it was extremely costly in terms of regulatory burdens, I should be able to move to West Virginia or wherever, but I can register my dissatisfaction with my movements. Um, but that that depends on having a a environment where you can move. Again, you also have to commit and make sure that you are committed to separating from the federal government. Uh, and so, the, you know, people that push back on the on the separation point when they do say, "Well, look, you're not going to get the handouts from the federal government anymore," uh, they have a point. I mean, that's but that's part of the reason for splitting. So you just got to make sure you're comfortable with that um, because that those transfers. Uh, are not going to be there. And, and uh, uh, that's certainly a cost and one that people need to feel comfortable with if they want to pursue this as a actual, you know, real world co course of action. So cost benefit. Hey, red states, if you leave, you're going to lose a lot of federal funding. But for the first time ever, maybe in a century and a half, you actually have the chance to reduce the regulatory burden down to what you at your local economy scale feels appropriate rather than fighting with the federal government, which will never, ever, 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 ever let you have that. Yep. Uh, let me ask you about Ireland and Puerto Rico. I think you're saying uh, that those are fair examples. So Ireland has the lowest corporate tax rate in the world, roughly. Puerto Rico has no income, uh, federal income taxes. With things like having a really low corporate tax rate to attract investment from around the world and having effectively no federal income tax, to be able to attract investment from former American states, would that be beneficial to an economy or bad for an economy? Certainly beneficial. I mean, again, you know, people tend to talk about, in America and elsewhere, but they tend to talk about corporations as if they're this entity that kind of acts unto itself, that has unlimited resources, that you can just take resources, extract resources from, and there's no cost to doing that. Uh, but there's human beings that are running these corporations and they respond to incentives. Economists talk about incentives and incentives are the proclivity of human beings to respond to changes in costs and benefits. And so when you raise the cost of something, you get less of it, uh, holding all else constant. When you increase the benefit of something, you get more of it. That's when an incentive is uh, in the broadest sense. And so how does that apply to this? Well, imagine you, you are an entrepreneur and you have this vision for this really innovative idea. You want to bring a product or a service to market. And again, you don't know if it's going to be successful, but you think it will be, of course, or you wouldn't pursue it in the first place. And you need to raise capital and you need to invest not just your time and effort, but millions of dollars in order to get this thing off the ground for a potential profit. It's not guaranteed. The smallest change in tax rates, half a percent, a percent, certainly 2%, 3%, matters an enormous deal. Mm. We're talking here, uh, in many cases, millions of dollars. And so people are going to adjust their behavior accordingly. Uh, and, and so when you lower that, you're going to attract people who otherwise would be turned off from investing with a higher tax rate into your economic system, into your economic space. Uh, and vice versa, if you ra raise taxes or you, in you increase the regulatory burden, you're going to push some people out who otherwise would have come in. And so if the goal is to spur economic activity, to spur innovation, 
entrepreneurship, which, as we discussed earlier, is really the fountainhead of economic wealth and wealth creation, then reducing those things is one means of encouraging that type of behavior, which will certainly improve human well-being, not just economic well-being, but human well-being, because economic well-being and human well-being are, are linked together. I, this is going very well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another criticism that I've heard, and I had my opinion, and that's why I went on at, wanted to ask you, was, oh, if these red states left, well, we'd have borders between every state, you know, like East Germany, West Germany during the Cold War, and nobody would be able to travel and nobody would be able to trade. And I go, who would agree to that? NAFTA uh, was signed between Mexico, Canada, and America and re-signed. We have foreign nationals from Mexico driving through the border, through America and into Canada. And while there's some criticism, it's basically been going on for two decades. So if we can have Mexican nationals who don't even share, a and I'm Mexican, so I can say this, a language and a culture, then why can't we have Southern states just, oh, we left. Well, we want to rejoin NAFTA. We accept all the original terms from NAFTA, just like Mexico and Canada. Couldn't they just be right back in? I mean, if they're a separate country, don't they have the right to join the terms of NAFTA? And wouldn't that reinsert them back into the original agreement? Well, I'm not sure on the specifics of that in terms uh, on terms of NAFTA, but but if we think about it, in, in if we think about it in the in the what are currently the United States, as I mentioned earlier, it certainly would be a cost in terms of when you separated, let's say at the state level, you separate and you would have to reach agreements then with with your neighbors. But we could envision that happening. We could envision people reaching an agreement where you have a mutual exchange of citizens from one one polity moving into another. We, we have that already. Now, we also can envision a situation where some the members of some polities, state level or, or whatever level we're talking about, would vote to block people from other polities. But there's a cost to that. Uh, you know, one of the benef one of the costs, of course, of saying we won't trade with you is that you suffer the economic consequences. Um, so you certainly can do that. Uh, that, that's a personal preference or a voter preference issue. Uh, but there's a significant economic cost to doing that because of the economic benefits that you and I were just discussing will be curtailed because now you're blocking entire groups of people that can mutually ben uh, trade with you for mutually beneficial exchange. But there's one other point I think is important to, to reflect upon perhaps, which is even in the United States, the way it is now, you know, people tend to talk about America like it's a homogenous kind of lump of people that have a shared culture. Uh, uh, you know, there's the English language, of course, but anyone that's traveled throughout America, and this is part of the conversation, why we're having this conversation, because there's variation across people and, and, and localities. But even within states, again, I'm sitting in Northern Virginia right now, so I'm 13 miles outside of Washington, D.C., but I've also lived in Southern Virginia. And if you travel by car just two or three hours from where I'm sitting right now, the culture of Southern Virginia is dramatically different than Northern Virginia. It's much more of a, what I would describe as a traditional Southern type culture where Northern Virginia is much more, and I'm from the Northeast originally, I grew up outside New York City. It's much closer to that Northeastern type A, really intense kind of uh, uh, pace and personality here. Uh, but you know, we don't worry about that within Virginia. So we have this thing we call the state of Virginia and there's huge variation in culture. And we seem to get along fine. I, when I drive down to Southern Virginia, I interact with people and uh, uh, they interact with me peacefully. So why can't we envision this, not just within states, but across state borders? And I think we can. And so from that standpoint, I, have, I personally have a lot of optimism uh, about individuals, even with their differences, uh, being able to find common ground to interact and, and cooperate with people but more importantly, you know, to tolerate people and toleration doesn't mean agreement and toleration and freedom means the ability not to interact with people. I don't have to like what you do, um, but I have to tolerate the fact that you also have the freedom to do what you want to do. And to my way of thinking, that's a doesn't solve all the world's ills, but it's a it's a good way of living. And, and I think these type of arrangements might benefit from that, but also encourage that as well. Great, great, great synopsis. Uh, let me ask you as an aside then, because this is the question that we ask everybody. No wrong, no right answer. 
When Marjorie Taylor Greene made her comment that she wanted to have a national divorce on President's Day, the response from a lot of media on the left and on the right was, there's no political division. What is she talking about? There's nothing like that. She's making political division up for her own base. She's not actually speaking about real issues. Basically, all Americans get along with each other. What is she talking about? And I, I, does that seem realistic to you? Is there no division in America? Do we not have increased political division? Is everything hunky-dory? Well, I, I think it depends. And so here's what I mean by that. I'm not trying to avoid answering the no, question. No, no, please, please. I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Um, you know, I, I think certainly if you look at certain opinion polls on certain topics, certainly there's divisions in America. Uh, but, you know, we're still a country as of right now. There, and, and there's certainly pockets of violence. But compared to other countries that have constant civil wars and uh, other type of large scale violent conflicts, we don't have that. So from that standpoint, you could make the argument that in some kind of broad meta sense, the div there's divisions, but they, you know, it's still holding together right now. On the other hand, I th certainly I think we see lots of cracks on, on a variety of policies, and you're seeing some of that right now throughout the country on things like education policy at both the grade school, high school level, but also higher education. Certainly you see it with things like health care uh, and discussions about health care. You see it in terms of uh, policies related to abortion, for instance, and gun rights. Uh, and one of the arguments for having a, a more polycentric or decentralized structure, which, by the way, was the argument behind federalism um, and the, you know, the division of powers between the state and the federal government, uh, was that it allows people to express their preferences over these big, pol uh, these big kind of policy questions by moving around. And when you turn to what we call a more monocentric or top-down, monocentric means one single, so the, the national or federal government, you necessarily have homogenous policies that apply to everyone because you have a single decision-making center and it pushes down policies. And in some way, that, that leads to more division. And you say, well, that's weird. How does that lead to more division? It's a single entity. Because then whoever's running that single entity, whether it's Republicans, Democrats, and of course, there's lots of variation within those political parties gets to exert their control over everyone. Right. And, and, and so you're going to get these natural splits where when you push things down lower, you are dispersing that power uh, amongst a, a larger number of decision-making units, which you can make the argument actually will create an environment that better buffers against divisions and extreme divisions, precisely because you don't have one party or one group of people forcing down policies on everyone. And then it's just a question of how far you want to push that down. So again, you know, in some sense, people getting up in arms about this kind, these kind of statements, whether you know, wh whomever's making them about about the national divorce type stuff. Well, again, think about the idea of federalism. The idea of federalism is that states have certain powers that the federal government doesn't. And then it's just a question of how far you want to push that logic. And you don't, by the way, in principle, you could go even lower than the state. The state's just another unit we have that we identify with. Within states, of course, we have counties and towns. Uh, we have lots of little sub locales and polities within that. And so we have a quite a, a diverse country from that perspective, um, which offers, I think, an array of, of great opportunities. So let me ask you about that federalism. One of the people have said, or one of the critiques of Marjorie Taylor Greene, that we don't need to split up. We can just pursue federalism. And this is the question that I've asked about 20 professors. And, and, and what bothered me was that I don't think many of them had thought about this. Um, Republicans have talked about federalism for decades. We need federalism. We need federalism. We need federalism. Then we had the Supreme Court overturn Roe v. Wade and pass the power back down to the states. I'm in California and I knew people in New York. All left states viewed that as the federal government taking away our access to abortion. They did not view it as power going back to the states. I remember people in California, and I was trying to argue with them, going, look, calm down. California will never take away a woman's right to abortion. We will fight tooth and nail to that. And the power has been delegated to the state. And they were still, no, no, they're coming to get us. They're coming to get us. So there was almost no backup by leftists that I saw of, yay, federalism. 
And then on the right, I, I saw Mike Pence, the vice president of the Republican Party, the day after Roe v. Wade, and they passed power back to the states, go, not good enough. We need a national abortion ban where we force our conservative agenda on all other states. He was not criticized by the Republican Party and backed up by many conservatives. So if we have one political party that you know, espouses the virtues of federalism and then turns on it at the first opportunity they get in three to five decades, and we have the other party completely reject it, what chance do we have of returning to federalism in America? Yeah, that's a, a, a great question, an important one. And, and I, my own view is something like this. We already have federalism on, on the books. In other words, the, the way the country is structured is based on that, the United States. But we've lost it because what happened is through time, and this goes back you know, through the progressive era and then up through the, the, the New Deal, is you, you have something called uh, cartel federalism. And cartel federalism operates something like this. In order for federalism to work, uh, it, both in principle and in practice, you have to have very clear, bright lines that are not, you can't cross over them. And so the federal government's going to do X and they only do X. And then the states do Y. And then whatever comes out of that, that's what it is. Because that's the division of, of powers. And what has happened through time and this is partially due to the, the, the incentives in politics. It's due to ideological changes in the way people view their relationship to the government and the role of government in American society is the national government has taken on more and more control. And what has happened is instead of that division of, of powers between states and the federal government, the federal government, by giving all these goodies, port making it rain so that all these states get these goodies, have created a cartel. Sorry. They have... Yeah basically created a unified kind of homogenous entity, the United States, that becomes dependent on the federal government. That goes for money that flows through the healthcare system, through the education system, through through the militarization of police, through 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 the transfer of military grade arms from the federal government down to state governments, which right, under, under which, Obama, yes. Yep, uh, and well, even be, it started under actually interesting even before that, but it ramped up under Obama uh, uh, as part of the war on terror. Um, all of these things erode federalist checks because they make states increasingly dependent on the federal government. And this is what I was trying to get earlier when I said, well, if you're going to make this move to separate, then, then you got to make the move to separate and you have to cut it off. You can't if you're going to keep one foot in each of the two worlds and say, well, we're kind of going to pull back, but then when we want funding for X, we're going to come and ask you for it. It's going to unravel. It, it will. It might mm -hmm. work for a short period of time, but it's unsustainable. And that's the challenge. And the problem now is that the, the, the ideological views of both sides, and I think the examples you provided with Pence, it, it really highlights this, is that... Both parties, again, there's different people in each party, so I'm, in some sense I'm um, distilling it down in too simple of a form, but I still will for the purpose of our discussion. They're comfortable with federal power. They're comfortable exerting power over the entire country as long as they get to wield it. And that's problematic. Now, can we move back towards federalism? Of course we can. What does that require? Well, at a minimum, and I think as a starting point, it requires a ideological shift. Because at the core of this, it's how do people, the citizenry, view their relationship to the government and what is required of the government? That is, mm. if people are under the, mm. if their worldview is that gov the federal government is necessary and required for us to live our life, then it almost becomes a parent-child relationship where, where we are dependent on our savior on our parent, the state, the federal government to take care of us. And that needs to change in order for this type of, of structure that we're talking about to even be possible. Uh, because absent that shift, the, there's going to be no pushback against the federal government. Politicians in Washington, D.C. don't have an incentive to give up power. Uh, they, the, saying that. Rhetorically, they, they pay lip service to it, right? which is why many Republicans, when they're not in power. What do they say? 
free markets, got to balance the budget, got to do X, Y. And then they come to power and it's like, you know, just let the spigot <laughs> turn it and then other people deal with it in the future. Uh, and so that's just an issue of incentives in politics. And so really my view on this stuff is that the push has to come from bottom up, from the citizenry who okay. says, you know, we've had enough and we need change. And if citizens don't want that, then the change isn't going to happen because, again, in, in D.C., I'm pointing out the window because I'm, I'm in northern Virginia. Right, right. Uh, uh, that's not going to happen. No, no one there is going. There's not enough pressure in D.C. proper to ever scale back government. So we would have need to have seen blue states going, thank you, Supreme Court. We appreciate return to power for ourselves. And we would have need to have seen at, at the at basic population level. And we would have need to seen a lot of conservatives go, I'm not an official in the party, but I am disgusted with what Mike Pence said. That goes against 50 years of our policy. Let's unseat this guy. And we saw none of that. Right. And then and then to also say, like, look, uh, now things are at, uh, at the state level, let's say. We're going to do what we can control. I don't like what the other polities are doing, but I, it's not my job or my duty or my constitutional right to tell them what to do. And it's not their duty or constitutional right to tell us what to do. And absent that, because the minute you're under the un, under the worldview that you get to tell other people and other polities what to do, then you're just back to a monocentric top-down structure. And then it's just going to be a competition of who gets control of, of, the, of the levers of power. And then whoever gets control of levers of power is going to impose their thing. And then it just uh, turns into a, a, a kind of a war to control that, which makes perfect sense. But it's a logical outcome of the structure of the system. I had heard from some foreign scholars that most of the democracies in the world do not follow the American style of democracy. They have more of a parliamentary style where you have to have three or four parties agree to form a coalition government. And the reason that they do that is they call the American style the American winner-take-all style. I won, screw you. And in other, almost every other country, including Afghanistan and Iraq, that were supposedly created by America as democracies, they didn't even follow the American model. They follow this coalition government model where you have to have like 65, 70 percent of the government come together and say, OK, we agree with each other so that you don't have this. I won by 51 percent. So 49 percent of the country can you know, screw up. like uh, do you think that's part of the issue that we don't have to form coalition governments and we can have a I won by one percent. All 49 percent of you can go screw yourself. I think that's certainly part of it. So the coalition idea, as you put it nicely, you have to have a, a large number, a, a large percentage or, or, or people representing a significant percentage come together. But the other really fascinating thing about those structures is it allows for views that are considered outside the mainstream to be part of the conversation. They, they have a relatively small weight, but they have weight where in our system, because of the winner take all logic, the, the like the, it's near impossible for a third third party to, right. to to win. They can come in and influence on certain tail ends, depending on the size of them. They can pull votes away from one of the two main candidates, but it's always going to collapse down into to one of the main two. But I think the bigger issue is so there's the structure of the government. Yes, but the sir. bigger issue is the power that the government has. I mean, think about it. The, part of the reason people get so upset, whether Trump's president, whether Biden's president or or whomever is because they get to do a lot of stuff. They get to do a lot of stuff that impacts the lives of ordinary people uh, uh, in a significant way uh, uh, in the most cherished areas of life, our freedoms, our liberties, our education, our health care. But that's a matter of government power. Uh, if they didn't have that control, then you know, in, 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 you could you could make the argument that if you stripped government of enough power, in some sense, it wouldn't matter who is running because what are they going to do? Uh, uh, but we care a lot because they can start wars. They can gut uh, an education system. They can change uh, educational curriculum. They can influence our health care quite dramatically. And then you say, well, OK, we have legislative checks. But even that's gone out the window because now you get the rise of things like executive orders where uh, 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 you remember Obama, right? I have a pen and I have a pen and a phone. And so now once you open the floodgates of, well, I don't even need to bother with the legislature anymore. That has its own problems. I'm talking about Congress when I say legislature. Absolutely. You just say, well, I'm going to write whatever law I want down. The next person comes in and says, well, I'm going to change all your laws. And then you just get, again, kind of one person or a small group of elites wielding 
an enormous amount of power over an enormous population who has very diverse set of preferences and wants. And so, of course, you're going to get divisions. I mean, what would you expect to happen uh, uh, on, in that world? It's, it, it, so from that standpoint, again, focusing on the structure, but also focusing on the power that's centralized in the hands of government, I think, is quite important. I, I totally agree. I was there when Obama was going to pass DACA, and I said, uh, immigration is the role of Congress and not his, and you're going to have, you're creating a bad precedent. So he's going to come in and save everybody, and then the next president, you don't, and nobody knew Trump was going to be president at this time, uh, can literally use the list that you all registered with Obama with to go and hunt you down and grab you. And that's exactly what happened with Trump. And I remember trying to explain this to fellow Latinos when Obama was around and they just, they couldn't picture that future. They couldn't picture that Obama's president. So there might be a president who dramatically disagrees with Obama. And now you have set yourself up for them to, to come and get you. It was just like, no, no, can't happen. Unicorns are real. Can't happen. It's always going to be a great day. And I'm like, you have no idea who's going to be president four years from now, eight years from now, where the country is going to be, what the swing is. And people are putting their faith into these systems because I think they have, like you said, the old perspective of the federal government that we would gradually make these changes to a new plateau so everybody could see it coming over two to three decades. And yeah, you could complain, but you kind of go, wow, this is kind of the way that things are going. Now it's it's this way, and then tomorrow it's this. And then the next day it's this, and then tomorrow it might be this. And I think what you're saying is if we had more federalism and the federal government didn't have that much power over people's lives and they didn't have the ability to swing so dramatically, maybe people might not beat each other's throats or so worried about the other side won. That's exactly right. Because because the benefit of controlling that position of power now has fallen. And so you'll still have divisions on some margins. It's not a panacea that all will be right in the world. But if we're thinking of ways to both, if people are are, are concerned about kind of a polarized society that's one way to resolve it but also just better meeting and satisfying the wants of citizens which are ultimately in a democratic system a liberal democratic system citizens are supposed to be the drivers of policies there's a reason we call them political representatives they are supposed to represent the interests of their constituents not impose their preferences upon their constituents but the more you centralize power at the at the higher and higher levels, it makes it more likely that's going to be the case. Let me ask you another question if I can. I have two more questions if I if I may. Um, and I wanted to focus on economics, but you're really you're you're really informing us um, on some larger issues here that we've been asking a lot of people. So when Marjorie Taylor Green made her call for a national divorce, there was a Utah governor who said, we don't need national divorce. We just need marriage counseling. Uh, Joe Biden ran as the decent version of America, a return to decency. He also said he was going to heal the nation and bring people together and that there would be a national calming after he was elected and we would all come back together and he'd reach out to Republicans. The Republicans realized Trump's bad. And then we had January 6th. Um, how, what is marriage counts? Oh, and then after January 6th, we had Joe Biden give a speech in front of a blood red backdrop with active duty Marines, where he said 78 million Americans appear to be enemies of the state. No president's ever had a blood red backdrop or active duty soldiers or said anything like that. How, what does marriage counseling look for, look like for a population of two to 300 million that's undergone these two dramatic events? Yeah, that's a great question and a hard one. And I'm not sure. And and in some sense, my, my reaction to that is to say marriage counseling is the wrong way to, to think about it. Because when we think about marriage, you are committing to living with someone for presumably life. You are in a mutually deep-seated loving relationship in a way that you're not with people outside that marriage. And so, you know, perhaps a better way to think about it, in, in my head at least, is a neighbor, which is how do you get along with a neighbor? Um, so you, you know, imagine a marriage and you're in a house and then you have neighbors around you. 
And some of those neighbors you don't talk to, but you also don't do anything to them. It's not like you have any ill will towards them. Other neighbors you're friendly with uh, and other neighbors you have conflicts with. And conflicts are a part of life. Conflict doesn't mean violence, by the way. It just means we're, all of us have conflicts. You know, you wake up in the morning and your significant other and you both want the pot of coffee at the same time. That's a conflict. You have you have kids. They both want the, the, the Roku controller at the same time to control what's on Netflix. And that's a conflict. And how do you resolve that? One way to resolve that is to punch each other. The other way to resolve it is to say, look, we have to live together so we don't hit people. We teach kids that from a young age. And we're going to work this out. And that can be turn taking. It can be we're going to flip a coin, whatever. But that's the way I view it. And so I think marriage counseling is the wrong kind of comparison because living in a, in a society, certainly a society the size of the United States is not a marriage. I, I don't need to have a intimate, even friendly relationship with people in California, since you're there and I'm here in Virginia, in order to coexist with them, in order to respect them and they and tolerate them at a high very high kind of level and let them live their life now some people i'll be very close with we all have close friends family friends others i'll will be acquaintances many i won't know they'll just be anonymous people to me and so i think the you know in some sense it, that that way of thinking and that that marriage counseling i think gives too much credit to the politicians uh, and, and kind of makes them too important because it's like, well, we, we need to figure out how to get along. But they're not the ones that run the country. Uh, as I was saying earlier, they're, they're representatives. And, and, and in some weird way, this whole thing's been flipped over where, where, where representatives in Washington, D.C., the executive branch, the legislative branch, the judiciary as well. But but I'll, I'll put them third for now, have kind of become the focal point of everything. Like they run the show. What You know, they're they're kind of everything revolves around them. Uh, and why? 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 Why do we tolerate that? Uh, uh, if if we're living in a, a society where the citizenry are the driver of things, then they should be in the background. Again, there's a reason the term public servant. I'm emphasizing the servant point here existed at a point in time, and people use that rhetoric. So when you hear people on a pol on a political campaign, they'll say, "I'm here to serve you." OK, but what does that really mean? And very quickly, for anyone who's been around Washington, D.C., you realize that's not the case. And, and then even at state governments, too. But certainly at Washington, D.C., the, it, 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 the entire northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area takes on a life of its own. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of this self-extending, self-important, arrogant uh, uh, kind of we run, the, we, we run the world, not just the United States. We run the world kind of mentality. Uh, which I think is quite dangerous to the very idea of a free democratic uh, uh, society. And so getting away from that, I think, is good. And, and, and one of the things I always try to do is, is to step back and say, why are we giving these politicians so much kind of credit and power over us the way we think about their role? Uh, and also the the magnitude of uh, 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 and scope of power and respect that we give them over our lives. Those are objects of choice um, and, and ones that, that we as citizens, whether explicitly or implicitly, have to allow. And so I think that's an important thing for each person to think of as a as a member and a citizen of a, of a free society. Uh, and, and I think it has radical implications when you actually internalize that. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. I remember... <sighs> I saw this in movies and then I read up on it and, and, and did some more research, but in ancient Egypt, it was kind of a dictatorship and they had a priest class that could read and write and would advise the emperor, but it was a very small group of people who had access to the information and they were cut off from the public. You also look at the, um, the Catholic church was sort of a dictatorship for about four or 500 or years over Europe. And they had a specific priestly class that could understand Latin. Nobody else would be taught Latin. You couldn't know how to read and write. Only the priest could, so they could have control. And then you have the Carolingian um, uh, situation, I think, in France under Charlemagne, where they also had a priesthood. Every time you have a selective priesthood, and they're the only ones that know the knowledge, and the public doesn't even know how to read and write or know how the conversation is going, it always ends up in a dictatorship. It always ends up with elites making decisions for vast amounts of people. And, and they just have to go along with it because they couldn't even participate in the discussion. 
Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I think that's a bad sign. Let me ask you this question. If we do not return to federalism, does the vision get worse in America? Does it stay the same? Do we go, hey, you know what? Let's just hug each other and get over it. Um, what do you see the future if we do not reduce the tensions of I won and now I'm going to get my way and force all my will on you and you have to just deal with it? Yeah, well, I I, I, I remain optimistic whether that's naive or not. I'll, I'll, I'll leave to others to decide. I mean, I have uh, you know my own life and my, my children, of course, so I want the future to be better and I want them to both grow up and live in, in, a, in a country, in a world that is peaceful and, and, and tolerable, um, uh, meaning that, that, that open to different ways of living with different worldviews and so on. Whether that's the case or not, I don't know. And part of that is, you know, that there's external factors that are beyond our control. But so the way I always think about it is what things can we control? There's certain things, choices we have as citizens of a country and what things can are, are in our control to do. And I think this matters a great deal, both at the state level, at the local level, and at the federal level. You know, I, I do a lot of writing on international relations, as you mentioned my book at the beginning on American empire. And people say, well, why are you focused on America? What about China, Russia? They're, and I say, yes, they, I don't, I, I have many issues with these governments, but I live in the United States. I, I, I'm a citizen of the United States. And I, I as that, there are certain things that are in my control, or at least I can influence. And so that's why I can control what I, what, what, what my local government or have some influence over that, what they do. I can, I can control what I think as a member of uh, a, a citizen of the United States. And so I think, think looking internally, not just looking externally at the world's ills and taking a serious look, but also at the core of it in order to get over any division you have to have a shared baseline. And that's what this comes mm. down to. If you don't have a shared baseline, if you view other people, mm. so if you do identity politics and you view people outside of your group as either evil or less than human, you cannot have any kind of conversation. So if Republicans think Democrats or Democrats think Republicans are inherently evil or bad people, or whether it's based on nationality or gender or whatever, you can't even have a conversation in the first place. And that's my biggest fear, that we can't even sit down and say, OK, here's my views. And then you say your views. And I say, well, I, I agree with you here and disagree here. Let's talk this out. And we may never fully convince each other. But the idea now that, you know, you hear someone has some identity marker, again, Republican, Democrat, whatever it is, or, or even a state they're from in some case or support for a political candidate and somehow they're inherently evil is quite problematic. And so from that standpoint, I, I worry greatly. And, and the other thing I just want to mention before we, we move on, you know, you asked me if we don't move towards federalism or the, is the divisions going to get worse? One of my great fears is this in-between I was talking about earlier. So I do worry that if we try to keep our, people try to keep one foot in each world, the federalism world and the, the monocentric or top-down national government world, it's going to actually make things worse. Because you're getting like the the worst of both worlds. You're 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 getting still the national government expansions in, in the power of national government, and you are continuing to erode federalism, and you're giving federalism a bad name. Because what happens is people say, "See, this is what federalism does. It leads to the, these divisions and this chaos." Where really that it's kind of a perverted form of federalism because it's it's this form of federalism which exists in name. But in practice, it's so entangled with the federal government that uh, it's a very, at best, distorted view of federalism, if you can even call it federalism at all. I get what you're saying. If you're going to have real federalism, you better break off from the Leviathan or its tentacles are going to make sure you don't actually get what you want. Exactly. Uh, there was this poll that came out a while back uh, in uh, September 3rd, 2021 by Brightline Research, and I think it's getting at what you're saying. Uh, I'm sorry, it's from the University of Virginia, uh, Sabato Crystal Ball Center. Uh, deep, persistent divides between Biden and Trump voters, September 30th, 2021. 80% of Biden voters and 84% of Trump voters in 2021 feel elected officials from the other party are a clear and present danger to America. 
74% of Biden voters and 78% of Trump voters feel all other voters from the other party are a clear and present danger to America. I, I think that's getting at what you're talking about, where we have these intense levels of distrust. The other guy's an enemy. They're not just different. Uh, I'm used to the language clear and present danger to America, meaning something like Al-Qaeda, a nuclear missile strike from Russia, the rise of China taking over the Pacific fleet. Well, now we're using it to elected officials and fellow American citizens who've not broken the law. Good sign, bad sign. Terrible sign. Ter what? Terrible sign. I mean, oh. especially when it comes to, especially when it comes to, to, to citizens. Again, you know, you, 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 you. When you start viewing your fellow citizens as enemies, in some sense, the the game is up or close to being up. Because how are you going to coexist? I mean, how are you going to live together with people that are, that are going to have different views than you? Again, you know, the fact that that people get so angry that people don't think like them is is very alien to me. Because it's you know, have people walked around in the world? I mean, you know, and then you expand the size of the of the people you interact with. Of course, you're going to have different views. Just like. Some people like asparagus and some don't. Some people like pineapple right. on their pizza or some don't. And you say, right. well, no, no, that's silly. Those are food choices. Well, just take that and extend it. People have different preferences. Now, you, uh, as I was saying earlier, you do need to have some baseline level of agreement in order to get things off the ground. But it's very thin. What I mean by thin is you don't need a lot. It can be, I respect you as a person. Here, here are kind of our property rights. You have your person. I have my person. You have your views. I have mine. So you can't take your views and impose them on me right? and vice versa. Right. That's what I mean. That's what I'm trying to get at with that. But then beyond that, you can worship how and who you want to worship or not at all. Right. I can do the same. And then so on down the line. And I think that's where a lot of divisions come in. And going back to your point about the with Pence, with the abortion discussion, that's exactly what's happened. It's that I'm going to impose my views on everyone whatever side you're coming from. Yeah. And that's the role of the national government to do. Once you, un once you unleash that, uh, it's, it's tough. It's tough. And so, um, you know, for, for I, I, I'm neither a, uh, I'm not a, a registered Republican or Democrat. So I have friends that are kind of both and family members. Doesn't and so I, I get to experience both sides of it. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's interesting. And on some, you know, on some margins, on some issues like farm policy type issues, I tend to um, get along much more with, uh, even though this is kind of shifting now, interestingly, but those on the left, especially some people on the far left, because I'm very hesitant of, and skeptical of foreign interventions. Hey. Uh, and then on economic issues, I tend, uh, again, which is changes every, depending who you're talking to, but historically, those who are more right leaning, I, I get along quite well on uh, when I'm talking economic issues. And so um, you know, it's been, but it, that gives me hope because I'm able to see areas of common ground with all different ideologies. But again, we need this fundamental commitment to toleration. That's what this comes down to. Toleration, not, that's not acceptance. Toleration, but a toleration is a, a fundamental commitment to using nonviolence, whether that's rhetoric, not, rhetorical nonviolence or actual violence against other human beings who you disagree with. Do you see other people acting like you are? Do you see a lot of other people going, hey, I work hard to not take a stance publicly and I make sure to reach out to this side and listen to that side. Is that what you see colleagues, friends, other people in Northern Virginia doing? Or do you see the total opposite of that? A, a mix. You know, uh, again, I, I, I certainly know acquaintances who who I think are are very well-intentioned and they act in good faith and... Um, they're quite respectful, and I, I think they're wonderful people. I know other people, either directly or, you know, even even through you, you see people even at the neighborhood level, the way they act and the the signage they put out and the way they interact with other people in our community. Whether it's even basic things like the fa local Facebook group for the our homeowners association, who are just vicious people. They 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 the way they interact with people are are is so harsh and. Mm -hmm without even knowing someone that's the way they act like this snap judgment that if you say X, I'm going to snap and come at you so hard right. that it's like you can't interact with them. Uh, and so uh, I, I certainly think it's a mix. I, I don't have any kind of broad survey data to, to point to. Um, 
But you know, again, you know, my own my own worldview is that uh, for most of things, I control what I do, uh, and uh, I try to live a certain way, and um, <clears throat> that's the best I got. My my opinion, opinion, not fact, opinion, is that you're unique in modern America today. I could be wrong. I'm not there. I haven't lived your life. Just something I I get a vibe from. In California, after Roe v. Wade was overturned, we had a lot of uh, women in California saying, we need to get everybody to come together, right? Everybody's got to realize that a woman has to have control over her body. Great, I'm in. And we need to reach out to those moderate conservatives who will know this and form a coalition to you know, push back on the alt-right conservatives. And I said, great, I'm a liberal, but I know a lot of conservatives around America and they agree with you. A woman has a right over her body and they will work with you. They just also believe a woman should basically be at home cooking, not necessarily have a job. They also believe in traditional gender roles. They're against transgender story time. Uh, they're kind of pro USA invasions. They're pro gun. They're pro religion. You guys are ready to work with them. No, disgusting. Not those people. I just thought you said abortion was an existential threat. Everything's on the line. We've got to do what it takes, all hands on deck, as long as they agree with this one point. When I lay out to you the kind of people you would have to work with, not one liberal that I talked to in California was interested in talking to those people at all. After they made a speech about existential threat and we all have to come together. Yeah, I mean, look, the the here's the challenge. The way the way our country is right now, the, you know, we can talk about these conceptual states of the world, but the federal government has an enormous amount of power over these. Just think about the list of policies you just named. It's enormous. These are huge policies that affect people in very deep and personal ways. And so, the likelihood of any one person, even within a political party, you know, a broad political party, Democrat, Republican, or, or Green Party, Libertarian, whatever, whatever party we're talking about, finding a lot of other people that align with them perfectly on every single issue is really hard to do. So, you've got to compromise if you're going to work in, in the current political structure. Now, one way to do it is to remove yourself from it, and not deal with that. You know, I'm, I'm not very politically active, so um, I, I don't have that firsthand experience um, because I think. I think for a lot of people, this goes back to our broader discussion, I think politics almost comes to dominate their life. And I think it makes them miserable I, because it creates these teams and it becomes all consuming. And then your person doesn't win and it's almost devastating to you. And it, it, it and, and it, it, it there, there's so much else in life that I think is valuable and and rich and precious and it's not that politics is important, so I'm not saying it's not. It's clearly important. But, you know, another thing I think is quite important is is recognizing the proper place of politics in our life. And of course, each person has to decide where they place that weight. But, you know, as a, as a matter of self-reflection, I think people thinking and saying like, all right, this is important, but it's not that important, whether it's my family, if that's if you have that or my own life. Uh, you know, living a good life and pursuing those things I want to pursue as a flourishing individual and, and being a good person, however you define that. Uh, those are important things, too. And, and and getting bogged down in politics can be soul sucking for a lot of people. And and, and uh, this goes back to, to what we were saying earlier. I think that as citizens, we need to be aware, at least, of, of giving too much power to politicians. That's just that's not just legislative power. It's power over our life. And when you give someone power over you, it's that when they make a decision, it has such an influence on you both directly, but also mentally that it can be devastating to you and, and really impose kind of harms on you. But that's because you've given that person the power to do that over you. And you don't have to. Again, they do things to you. You know, they, the federal government imposing tax rates on me. It, it has educational policy, which affects my kids. So I can't I can't escape that completely. But I can choose not to give people the time of day. I can choose to, to not invest my scarce, precious time, you know, getting angry about what's happening in Washington, D.C. today and instead talking to students who are interested in ideas or talking with you or spending time with my family. And again, each person has to decide that. But I think it's a, a quite powerful way to exercise our individual freedom, which we still have in this country. We, we, we lose it in many ways and we are losing it in many ways. But we still have a lot of freedom. 
certainly True. compared historically. And True. we shouldn't take that for granted. And one way not to take it for granted is to make sure you're exercising it and appreciating it on a daily basis. I, I absolutely agree. If you look at the amount of um, cancel culture, uh, it's, you know, maybe we won't have freedom of speech like we have 20 years from now. Yep. Um, last question. It's an economic question. Sure. So there's uh, a theory called the optimum currency area by Robert Mundell. Basically, the idea is that the federal government has the Federal Reserve, right? And they have 12 different districts. Yep. Um, and, you know, they release money in these different districts and everybody gets to have a say. But the policies are typically developed in New York or around New York. That's where a lot of the districts are. That's where a lot of the people are. One of the ideas is that because America is so large, you could have different economic um, atmospheres going on at the same time. So maybe the West Coast is going into a recession while the East Coast is experiencing massive growth. Maybe the Northeast is experiencing um, a depression while Texas is seeing massive growth just because of the distance that money moves. I, I don't want to get into it too much. But the idea was that uh there's some looking at is the united states an optimum currency area uh how well does that work but what i wanted to get to was this one so why did california have a recession in 2001 because the federal reserve uh raised interest rates so the federal the most of america was going into i think they were worried about inflation where, and so they wanted to raise interest rates to deal with inflation. However, California was not having inflation. California was having a booming economy and that sent us into an automatic uh, recession. So horrible for us, great for the rest of America. And that's what they mean about an optimum currency area is like, who's making your fiscal policies? And is it based upon how your local economy is working or what's best for someone on the other side of the continent? If red states left would they at least be able to ensure that their federal reserve has policies that benefit them and not necessarily someone else like right now federal reserve could make policies that benefit new york uh the new england area and are bad for the south depending on where they're at if the south is different they wouldn't have to suffer this problem anymore they'd have a federal reserve that can only enact policies based upon what their local economy needs in a way that helps it grow or control inflation. Is that roughly correct theoretically? Certainly, certainly. And, and you can go even further. And so so step back for a moment and and and, and think about it. This goes back to tie, tie this together with our earlier conversation. Anytime you have a single homogenous monocentric decision-making agency, it can be banking, it can be education, necessarily you impose one set of policies on everyone. And for all the talk of diversity in our country, people don't tend to point this out, which is that top down federal policies are anti diversity because you are imposing a uniform set of policies on everyone. It treats, as you put it quite well, people in California as being analogous to people in Texas, to being analogous to people in New York City. And there's certain margins of homogeneity. They're human beings. They live in this thing we call the United States, but the fundamental conditions are different. And so from that standpoint, shouldn't we be embracing the and, and that those fundamental conditions, by the way, aren't just economic conditions, but also preferences, what people want that live in those polities. Those things are different, but also California might be great for technology. Texas is great for cattle. You know, New York might be great for whatever. So why have a single set of policies that apply to all those things equally? And uh, uh, I, I, we have re, uh, I, I think I know why or, or one of the reasons we have that, because politicians like to control stuff. The more control they have, the better. But certainly you can imagine a situation where you had this kind of decentralized system that was better able to align in, in our discussion. Now we're talking currency currency with local conditions and local preferences. And the only thing I don't like about the idea of optimal currency, that I don't like the terminology because optimal implies that there's like one perfect, you, sure. know, you either have the perfect or not. I actually don't think that's how the world is. But I do think that 
because I'm more of a, rather than a design person, I'm more of an emergence person thinking that a lot of things emerge rather than come from top down because who's going to impose the optimal policy on everyone. That's what I mean by that. Right. But so, so you can imagine a situation of what's called competitive banking. So you had different, you have different banks, different currency issuers, and they would compete with each other. And remember the, 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 the federal reserve, what it's 1913, I believe it was, it was created. So it's not, you know, in the history of mankind, you know, people tend to, we always suffer from presentism, like the way, you know, here's how it is now. It must always be that way. Right. Well, no, actually not. Uh, for a long time, it wasn't that way. Uh, and, um, you know, there's a big debate in academics whether the Federal Reserve has been a good or a bad for the United States, uh, which is bigger than our conversation today. But I sure. will say it's not a foregone conclusion that it has to exist in its current form or that it's necessarily a good thing that it exists in its current form. I, I Yeah, I don't want to get into that uh, behemoth of a conversation, um, but I just... Yeah, it is a central authority. It is creating fiscal policy for everybody. And, and there's different regional economies. There, there was a book called Competitive Advantage of Nations, I think by Michael Porter. And he talked about what makes certain countries rich and others poor. And one of the things he pointed out was regional economies. Like Italy does very well because they allow different regions to focus on what they do. There's like a sports car valley in Italy, and the government recognizes that and makes economic policies beneficial for them that don't necessarily apply to the rest of Italy so that that area can have maximum growth. We don't do that here. Yeah, um, that's right. And then think back to what we were talking about earlier on top of all this. We were talking about earlier when you make centralized institutions overly important, you politicize them because everyone wants to control them. And what's happened to the Fed over time? I would argue it's become increasingly politicized. It's supposed to be independent. Right. So if you technically the Fed is independent, it's not it's not part of the, the government. But come on. I mean, uh, you know, the, the 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 political influence is enormous. Uh, and why? Because it has enormous political implications. So, of course, they're going to want to control it. So, again, the more you're able to decentralize things and have competition between different providers of goods and services, to my way of thinking, better meets the local preferences bet and conditions of people but also puts a check, an important check on centralized political power. Couldn't agree with you more. I remember, well, I, I looked it up later when I was older, came on as a boy, when I was a boy, but it was Alan Greenspan when he was uh, chair of the Federal Reserve and he did an interview on 60 Minutes or something and he shocked the country because he basically said, we do what we want and the president has to do what we say. And it, it like shocked the hell out of everybody. Um, but it was kind of a good thing. They were completely independent and didn't care about politics. Fast forward to now where we have Trump and, and maybe Biden criticizing the Fed chair and maybe he needs to be replaced. And I don't like I mean, Reagan would never even dream of criticizing the Fed chair. Neither would Bush. There used to be a period where presidents wouldn't dream of doing that. And now we've entered to, into a period where it's OK to do that. So I, I absolutely that is a politicization of, of this arm over the last couple of decades. Yep. And it goes back to the great point you raised earlier, which I, is, is worth highlighting again, that one of the kind of checks on our thinking, I think, as citizens is we never know who's going to control things in the future. And right. so things that look good now may not be the, you know, and so there's a, a, a famous philosopher named David Hume. He's an enlightenment philosopher and he's something called Hume's political maxim. And I think it's a great check on everyone's thinking. And it, the, the Hume's political maxim is when you're designing political rules, assume that the knave is in power and the knave is the undesirable person. So I, I always say to people, I'm giving public talks or talking to students about this stuff. It, it's does, this thought exercise doesn't answer all the world's questions, but it's a good check on your thinking, which is someone says a policy, whatever that policy is, and you like it. You say, go for it. I want you to think about your least favorite politician. It can be an actual person. Or it can be a hypothetical, like if I was defining my least desirable politician here, it would be, would you want that person to have control over that policy? And if the answer is no, that should give you pause to endorse that policy. Now, even though your person or your party might be in charge now. Uh, and again, that doesn't answer all the questions, but it, it's a good check on your thinking to make sure that you're you're being a reasonable and I think uh, balanced kind of citizen and thinking through what policies are desirable. I would say all of America failed the David Hume test when Obama was president. We couldn't mm -hmm. imagine that it wouldn't be just great presidents from then on out. And we gave them incredible powers. And then we got 
like you said, the knave, the worst possible option right after him, caught everybody off guard. They're like, oh, no, it'll always be Obama's from here on out. Yep. And everybody, everybody got that wrong. Like the experts, the me, everybody didn't see that. I mean, wow. They, yeah. David Hume. Why was he right? Yeah, it was a great, it's a great, it's a short little line about, uh, but it's a great line and it's a great way of thinking. I wish people internalized it more. Um, any last minute statements you would like to make? Any points you'd like to make? Did you have questions for us? Or my favorite thing to ask everybody, is there a thought you'd like to leave the public with that they can't get out of their head for the next week? Maybe they don't remember that all of this interview but they're five days from now and they're like, you know what? That that one professor said something and I just can't get it out of my head. Last minute thoughts, last minute things to say. Sure. Uh, if I So thank you for that. It's a lot of pressure. I got to come up with something big. I can't. I can't. Here's what I would say. I would say that I hope people realize and I think people take it for granted because we, we think of ourselves as being little people in this huge, enormous polity this huge, enormous government apparatus in this huge country, and it's all true, but what we neglect is the power that we have to be what I call micro-level peace entrepreneurs. And it says, well, that's a lot of verbiage. That's very academic -y. What do I mean by that? Each of us individually have enormous power to do good in the world, in, a ver in the sphere that we control. That can be our community, our family, church for those who are church going, whatever it is, your place of work, and what each of us can do is look for many different ways to facilitate peace in the world. And how do we do that? One of the ways we do that is to be cognizant of the things you and I have been talking about, being cognizant of how we treat people, how we interact with people. Uh, and that could be face to face, but on social media. You know, you read social media now and it's so easy to be vicious towards other people, but we don't have to do that. These are all objects within our control. And so when, once you realize the, the range of choices that we have as people throughout our daily life, because think of the number of people we interact with. We take it for granted. We walk around the world. We pass people. We interact with people in stores, online, enormous, thousands of people. That's within our power. And when you start thinking that in those terms, you realize how much control you have to be a force for good in the world. Even though it can be overwhelming when you step back and say, I have no control over what's going on in Ukraine or Russia or on healthcare or you know federal education policy. And that's true for the most part. But we have enormous amount of power to be a force for good in the world. And if people embrace that, not, not only will they do good or tend to do good because they'll be cognizant of it. But going back to what I was saying earlier, it will also check them from letting the 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 blurriness and the murkiness and sometimes the pessimism of the grand political uh, kind of fight that goes on in the background from taking over your life. And so it's a check to not only be a force for good in the here and now in the actual world, but for a, living a good life and insulating yourself from all that noise. And so hopefully people will think about that and consider adopting that as a, a strategy. It's one I try to follow in my daily life. Um, I felt a little bit better just hearing that. Uh, <laughs> we'll we'll end it there. I'll send you a copy of the video. You don't have to give any names, but one thing we always ask everybody is we're trying to have honest conversations with people around America. We find the debate on national divorce or political division to be you stupid red states. Oh, yeah, well, shut up, welfare queens. And we just think that that's sophomoric and childish for something of this magnitude. People don't have to be for national divorce. You could say it's a horrible idea. But shouldn't we as Americans have an intelligent conversation and shouldn't the public be informed? So you don't have to name anybody, but I am going to ask you in an email when I send you, do you have anybody that you could recommend who'd be willing to be part of an honest conversation and is somewhat thoughtful? Just sure. think of some names and I'll email you very shortly with that. Well, I appreciate that. All right. We'll end it there. Thank you so much. We'll see All you right. soon. Thank you, Professor. I will email you shortly. All right. It's been a pleasure. You stay well. All right. Stay well. All right. Bye-bye.